Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Star Wars is many things for many people. For some, it's the ultimate escape, a galaxy far, far away full of amazing planets to explore and interesting people to meet. For others, it's a galaxy full of conflict, awesome warships, entire armies of clones, and lightsaber-wielding superheroes. And then for others, it's an interesting political exercise that exposes the flaws of various governing systems. On this channel, and on Generation Films, we always strive to learn as much as possible from science fiction. One, because it's easier than reading books and getting a proper education. And two, artists usually create parallels between our world and the fictional worlds that they create. And as an avid fan of Star Wars, I've learned a lot from the franchise about politics and governance. The Rusan Reformation ended several centuries of terrible galactic-wide conflict between the Jedi-protected Republic and the Sith Empire. The horrors of warfare led to the popular support for demilitarization of the Republic and a return to a more decentralized defense. The federal military was defunded and all those resources were directed to subsidizing local planetary defense forces. In times of peace, this actually was not a terrible system. These types of local defense forces usually are far cheaper to maintain and support, and a good percentage of them were usually made up of volunteer reservists. The local defense forces were also better equipped and trained to deal with local threats, and morale was generally high because those who served in these forces usually fought to defend their local systems. Also, PDFs usually stayed within their local solar system. But serious problems began to arise when larger factions began threatening worlds. The same things that made planetary defense forces so great at defending systems made them terrible for defending an entire republic. While all planets in the Republic are technically supposed to support the central government in times of wider conflict, the reality was quite different. Most governors were hesitant to deploy their planetary defense forces to protect the rest of the galaxy. We saw this problem arise during the Naboo crisis. Without a federal military to step in on Naboo's behalf, they were essentially helpless against the Trade Federation, and no other planetary defense force stepped in to help. A similar thing happened after the First Order destroyed Hosnian Prime and the core New Republic fleet. The local defense forces across the galaxy were unable to coordinate and all selfishly guarded their own planet. This allowed the massive First Order fleet to overrun each planet one at a time. A federal military which is created to defend the entire Republic is much better suited for this kind of job. They have standardized equipment, a unified command structure, and battle tactics. Something that would be pretty hard to achieve by piecing together a hundred local defense forces. Even the Galactic Empire military with all of its problems was designed by Palpatine for when the Yuzang Vong fleet arrived to the galaxy. The Galactic Republic and the other smaller factions that replaced the Empire were completely unprepared for the Yuzang Vong invasion, and it took several years for them to form proper alliances and unify the galaxy against this external threat. The largest governing body in a galaxy needs a military force to protect its own people, but also to enforce its decisions. A vacuum of military presence in the Outer Rim during the Rusan Reformation slowly turned the area into a haven for criminal elements. Instead of developing a security force or creating infrastructure in the Outer Rim, the Republic decided to turn it into a special economic zone that was tax-free in order to entice businesses to invest capital in that region. Governments across our own world oftentimes subsidize or give tax breaks to corporations to do the jobs that they cannot afford to do. While government subsidies are not always a bad thing, not only were the Trade Federation allowed to operate tax-free, they are also allowed to arm their ships and serve as an ad hoc security force for the region. This means defending trade routes and colonies from pirates and criminals, but it also meant that the Trade Federation fleet was sometimes used to enforce corporate policies or to pressure local governments during business negotiations. Governments and corporations need to set boundaries on what each party can do or cannot do. While the Trade Federation has every right to protect their own private property, they should not have the right to use military force on public property in space. Security and defense of entire regions of space are an important job that should fall into the hands of the government because they technically should be more impartial than a corporation with their various business interests. When this balance was upset, the Trade Federation started abusing many of the colonies in the Outer Rim. Ultimately, many of these plants were fed up by the fact that they paid so many taxes to the Republic and it provided them with little to no support. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the massive Imperial Military Industrial Complex. 
What started out as an attempt to militarize the Republic in preparation for the Clone Wars never really ended as Palpatine continued expanding his own power indefinitely. The result was that large deposits of natural resources across the galaxy were nationalized along with entire industries. Ten years after the Clone Wars had ended, the Empire was not only the biggest employer in town, it was oftentimes the only employer. The events that led to the Galactic Civil War were not only a result of the Empire's human rights abuses and restrictions, but also their terrible economic development policies. During the reign of Palpatine, the galactic economy actually shrunk in size, and the government became this overblooded bureaucracy that existed for the sole reason of creating jobs for the sake of creating jobs. Government can never be the primary engine for economic growth. Capitalism, with the proper regulations, is far more efficient than any other economic system ever devised by man. In a proper balance between corporate power and government power will lead to a very healthy and successful society for everyone. The Republic was a democratic constitutional republic, not all that different from the United States or some other Western democracies. At its core was a galactic constitution that set up an important system of checks and balances between the Galactic Senate, Supreme Chancellor, and the Judicial Department. The powers of these three government branches are supposed to balance each other out, which is why this form of government is one of the more stable ones. Some might say that such government forms are inefficient because any action must be approved by the system rather than just one individual. But that's kind of the point. A democratic republic is pretty resilient to volatility and radical change unless the majority of the population vote for it. A strong republic should be able to withstand radical regime change because all members understand that there is a fair and just way to replace incompetent leaders. The fact that our country can go Clinton, Bush, Obama, and then Trump is a testament to our system. You might not agree with half of them or all of them, but at least you know they can't become emperor for life. When one part of this equation, whether it be the Senate or the Chancellor, tries to break this balance, we have a problem. Emperor Palpatine was able to use war and conflict with the Separatist Alliance to gain massive amounts of executive power, which led to him becoming the head of the Grand Army of the Republic. As the war continued to rage on, Palpatine was able to nationalize the intergalactic banking clans and control the printing of galactic credits to further increase the size of the military. Meanwhile, the power of the Senate began to erode as Palpatine created a large coalition that basically rubber-stamped anything that he said. After an assassination attempt by the Jedi, he used this instability to further undermine the Republic's institutions by declaring himself Emperor. And as Padme Amidala noted, So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause. In this scenario, the Senate lacked the courage to go up against Palpatine. As elected officials and an important part of the checks and balances within the Republic government, not enough senators opposed Palpatine's declaration of becoming the Emperor. And for good reason, some might say, because Palpatine had the popular support from the people. They absolutely loved him. By 19 BBY, he had successfully defeated the Separatist Alliance and protected the sovereignty of the core worlds. He had a cult-like falling, which brings me to another very important lesson about politics, which I learned from my time as a news cameraman. You can believe in an idea, you can believe in a nation, but never give your support easily to a political party or an individual politician. Make them fight for your vote and make them prove that they're worth your vote, because that's how the system works. When Palpatine became emperor, he didn't remove the Galactic Senate immediately or the Judicial Department. That would come later. But what he did do was expand his executive power and at the same time completely abolish term limits. Which is an important move for any dictator trying to transition a democracy to a more authoritarian style government. The Supreme Chancellor was technically supposed to serve only two four-year terms, but at the end of Chancellor Palpatine's second term, the artificially orchestrated separatist crisis was growing in the outer rim. Chancellor Palpatine argued that switching leadership during this very trying time could cause more instability. He was able to gather enough support in the Senate to overturn the term limit rules. This is something we've actually seen in America as well. Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president in 1933 at the peak of the Great Depression. For the next two decades, he transformed the American government's relationship with the people through the New Deal and massive federal infrastructure programs. By 1941, when his second term was over, he was a relatively popular figure. And America was being pressured both in the Pacific by the Japanese Empire and in Western Europe by Hitler's Nazi Germany. Sensing that war was coming to the United States, the people supported FDR for a third term and then eventually a fourth term. 
His was a special situation, though. There were technically no term limits at the time in the United States, but many historians argue that George Washington had set the two-term tradition after retiring after his own second term. It was only after FDR's fourth term that the 22nd Amendment to our Constitution set presidential term limits. Mayor Michael Bloomberg used similar reasoning to overturn term limits in 2009 while New York City was in the midst of a recession and was able to run for a third term successfully. But perhaps the most egregious problem in American politics is the lack of term limits in the U.S. legislative branch, where senators and representatives oftentimes serve for a lifetime if they desire. Without change and new people entering the system, we have stagnation and a lack of new ideas. Term limits are designed to make sure that one individual cannot have a huge impact on the government. It can also decrease corruption and at the same time increase political accountability of an individual in office. So there you have it guys, those are four lessons that I've learned from my time as a Star Wars fan, but let me know in the comment section below if there are any other lessons that I've missed. I'm sure there are plenty of great lessons and also one-liners from Star Wars that can teach us a lot about our own governing process. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.